In studio with the Admiral, Bill Stumblefield, two-star. Good morning again, Rob. Great to be here. Great to have you, Bill. Also, Maria Lawrenson, all-star. <laughs> Good morning. Glad to be here. Or the star. The star. <laughs> or the queen bee. I pulled out the t-shirt again last okay. week and couldn't wear it at home. It was just too much for the... Ha- has, for it been, the has it been washed? Yes, it's been, <laughs> been washed. What is Stop. that? Where did that come from? I was curious. She she wears it all the time. Of course, I she wear does her it laundry. Here and yeah, no. Stop. Maria has the cleanest clothes of anybody. <laughs> we know. We've done contests. We yeah, we have. <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, the bar was set at five full minutes of praise for Bill Stubblefield in the last segment. Tim Zaya is here to break that record with six full minutes of praise for Bill Stubblefield. You got the clock, you got the mic, go. But as you pointed out, it's the floor. He, we did not establish <laughs> it the ceiling. It could go beyond six. right ahead for the ceiling, Tim. Tim, good morning to you. <laughs> good morning to you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Tim's the director of the Day Report Center uh, here in Martinsburg. And uh, how many years you been doing that now, Tim? Oh, uh, August of 2016. So do that math for eight, eight-ish. Eight years. Coming up on eight years, yeah, in just, yeah. Uh, what, uh, about three weeks or so. Yes, August first is actually the eighth anniversary of the the Berkeley Day Report Center. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, well, very nice. So, uh, thanks for coming in this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, yesterday, we had on a couple of doctors from Shepherd who have published a study on PBMs, and uh, it's a multisyllabic word, Bill, that I like to hear you tackle. Photobiomodulation. Go ahead. PBM. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> Uh, and they, uh, after uh, uh, the discussion yesterday, they had revealed in their press release that the uh, Day Report Center would be one of their places to try to implement this. Tim, how familiar you are familiar are you with PBM treatment therapy, and uh, how will it be used at the Day Report Center? I am not terribly familiar with it. I, I was uh, involved in a meeting with Dr. Jenny Flora a few months back, and she shared a bit with me about photobiomodulation. It's a mouthful, and... Um, uh, the, some of their research has indicated that uh, people who um, y- use this light therapy, who, who have suffer, who suffer from uh, specifically from opioid use disorder, mm-hmm. um, in conjunction with other treatments, that they've seen a decrease in cravings and depression. And um, so she asked if uh, if they could advance some of the research at the Day Report Center, and I said sure. So we're we're in the process of gathering some volunteers who are willing to, to participate, and um, it's up and running. How will this uh, financially be handled between Shepherd and the Day Report Center? They had mentioned that these therapy treatments can cost, I think, $3,000 with the helmet that they use for the red light therapy? No no uh, financial impact to us at all. This is funded by Shepherd, and, and, Shep- I, and I can't tell you how, how it's being funded. Shepherd has a grant. Uh, that a uh, fairly sizable grant that would do this research. And my good friend, um, who you know very well, Bill, Don Padoff, has yes. been highly involved in this for years, and he's been uh, working really hard to get it to, if you will, catch on. Um, and he is um, semi-retired dentist yeah. now. We've had him on but the show. I, yeah, and when I've gone in and have a little twinge not because of flossing or anything um but he's quick to bring out that light and he's like you got to try this marie i'm like okay whatever you say don so yeah, it seems odd to most of us that a red light shined on you could change absolutely. things in your body but they they did a study on it. they apparently are having some success with it absolutely right so uh tim do you have any idea when day one of this implementation might be or how you'll do a screening process to find folks who might be interested in trying it it's it's already begun we started uh I don't, roughly a month ago, okay, um, and we're just seeking volunteers from our program who are already p- reporting for treatment and are involved in treatment. Um, primarily, our uh, our intensive outpatient programs. We're we're asking for participants of those programs if they'd like to um, be a part of this this research. And I can't tell you off the top of my head how many folks we have involved. Fifteen or twenty, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, who, who are yeah? And they're about a month along. Yep. So this is non-invasive. Uh, how does this compare? It's a different procedure, but the success compared to that what we've seen in West Virginia, WVU research, where they give me a hand on the doctor's name. That oh, I, I can't remember his name. Yeah. He was on 60 Minutes 60 a couple minutes, of months yeah, ago. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any idea, Tim? How I, it's I, I do not. Yeah. I do not. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find it. Yeah. Yeah, Colin will look it up. 
um, and, or someone will post it yeah. in our Facebook section soon enough. Tim, uh, there's a, there are a lot of different ways of dealing with recovery and treatment from addiction and uh, relapses are very common. It, this is not an easy thing to kick. Uh, once the, the brain seems to be wired in that direction, it seems to be tough to do some rewiring. In your experience, what works? Time. And that's um, one of the one of the great things about the Day Report Center is that um, these these are folks, our, our population, our participants are people who's who's uh, don't just have a, a drug problem that just started. These are people whose whose drug problems have gotten to a place where they're kind of recklessly making choices to support their habits, and they get involved in the legal system as a result of it. And years and years ago. Um, what did we do with those folks in Berkeley County? We put them in jail, um, and it was it was learned that uh, jail is is just not effective. There's no treatment provided in the jails, uh, so it became a revolving door for these folks. They were in and out. It became very expensive to the taxpayers. The Eastern Regional Jail bill was um, five million dollars or something like that some years uh, back. So the Day Report Center exists now to provide an opportunity for these folks to live in the community, uh, but to engage in treatment. They're, they're required to report, and they know that if they don't report, jail is probably going to be their consequence. So um, that gives them a bit of incentive to show up. And uh, the longer a person stays involved in treatment, uh, the more success we see. The, the programs in our, in our uh, society that boast the greatest long-term success rates are, are long-term inpatient programs. And um, I think it has a lot to do with the amount of time that these folks are involved in treatment. Um, Post-acute withdrawal syndrome for people who have been using opiates um, for, for years can last up to 12 months. And those, those uh, withdrawal symptoms, initially for the first you know, couple of weeks to 30 days, there's a lot of physical pain involved in, in withdrawal. But then for months beyond that, people experience depression and, and just a lack of um, contentment and peace and joy in their lives and that's because these receptors that that have been impacted in their brains have been have been depleted and 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 it takes time for those things to to kind of balance themselves out so the longer a person is involved in treatment the better and our program is a minimum of 12 months mm -hmm. and what's the percent of the people that start the program finish the program uh roughly 50 percent 50 percent now are there uh, short-term inducements, I can understand the long-term inducements, you're going to get past this and you're going to be a better person. But in the short term, are there what, what are the motivators to keep someone in the program? Specifically for our program, it's, it's, they, they understand that jail is going to be a consequence. Most of our folks are referred by the, uh, the magistrate courts, probation, parole, and um, they're told if you go to the day report center and you comply with the treatment requirements there, this legal consequence w won't be a thing. Um, so, so they understand that. And a lot of them initially, they're not too thrilled. They're not excited about coming. They'd rather not. Um, they'd rather continue on with their life as, as it exists at that moment. Um, but the ones that stick around, uh, they, after a couple of months, their, their head starts to clear and they go, wow, I really needed this to happen. And they appreciate it. Talk a little bit, Tim, about the expansion um, project that's going on right now, what you hope to accomplish, um, more people being able to, to be treated, and what that all entails. Sure, yeah. We, we started, uh, the Day Report Center started over at 800 Emmett Roush Drive, which uh, for, for long-term Berkeley County residents knows that that was the health department for many, many years. Um, but we, uh, we occupied that facility in August of 2016, and there were three staff members. And the Day Report Center began, and it's just grown and grown and grown since then. We now have 345 active participants, and uh, we, we have about 40 couple full-time staff members and some part-timers, and uh, it requires that many people to, to manage a caseload like that. Um, we occupied uh, the building that we're in now at 520 South Riley Street, which was CVS years ago. We, we're adjacent to the Sheriff's Department, which was Martin's, right? Yes. Martin's, yeah. Um, and we thought that that building would give us enough space to last us some years. It didn't. We filled it up. Um, right now, I have a number of staff members that are sharing office spaces. It's just not, it's not working too well. So 
this program, it it gives our residents an opportunity to move on the up to, to move to the other side of, of, of long term addiction and find and maintain long term recovery. And it's extraordinarily valuable for our community, not just financially, but for our residents. Uh, the financial aspect of it, right now we have 345 active participants. You, you do the, the jail bill math on these folks, and 100% of our participants would be in jail if not for this program existing. That jail bill would be about $6.8 million just for the people in our program right now. A year? A year. Wow. Yes. And that's about $48 a, a day. Forty. It's actually a increased a bit. Okay. Yeah. It, it was forty eight twenty five. I think it's 50, 50 couple okay. now. I think when Doug Copenhaver, who was one of the driving forces behind getting this going, Tim, first estimated what it would save on the jail bill, I think he was talking about a million dollars or more. And you're saying that cost it's, it's, is now $6.8 million. Initially, those were the thoughts. It's, yeah. it's, it's well above that now. So $6.8 million is what it would cost for just our participants at the day report center, you throw the home confinement offenders in there as well. That's another two and a half million. So it's almost ten million dollars. Yes, and these programs, home confinement and day report center combined, it's in the neighborhood of four and a half million, I think, mm -hmm. to to run them. That doesn't even account for all the grant funding and additional revenue sources that come back in to offset the cost to the county. To to finish Maria's thought, though, this expansion, we're at capacity right now, Maria. We, we, could not, we could not grow any more than we have. As you all know, our county is continuing to grow. And with growth comes more crime. The drug problem isn't going away. So in order for, for, um, for the county to continue to, uh, to, to serve, this expansion was needed. So um, it's projected to be done the end of August. I got my fingers crossed there. Um, the sooner the better. So hopefully early to mid-September, we'll be able to occupy the facility. And I'm hoping and, and I'm expecting to get a couple of sizable federal grants this year that will allow us to bring on more staff because we need more staff to continue to meet the need. How about state grants? Do you, do you get anything from the state? We do. We do. We have what a community. Levels? How much? I'm sorry? How much? What, what level? Uh, a total of state grants uh, combined, um, uh, 350000 or, or so. Mm -hmm. Most of our funding comes from federal grants. Are, are they specifically targeted that you can only use them in certain ways? Or is it for the operations of the facility? The, they can be used for, for staffing. They can be used for some of our drug screening supplies. Um, they can be used for materials and trainings and some travel and such. Yeah. Tim, we've had this discussion before. And when the opioid crisis was really reaching its peak in West Virginia, there were a couple different schools of thought in regards to those who use drugs. One was, well, people use drugs uh, and they get them on the street and whatever. The other one was, well, most of these people are folks who had prescriptions to painkillers from doctors. And when the m insurance ran out or the prescription ran out, they were addicted to these painkillers through legitimate reasons from their doctors. And next thing you know, they're on the street trying to score some heroin. Which is the more likely scenario with what you deal with? From my experience, um, uh, you know, and I have personal experience in, uh, in, in this addiction world and um, professional experience now. And, and most of my experience has led me to, to, to know that very few people who, who were not pre-existing leaned in the direction of partying and getting high and experimenting with drugs became addicts because of a, a prescription. Um, I've come across a couple in my career, but by and large, people who, who develop addictions to, to, to heroin and begin using heroin, they leaned in that direction prior to oxycodone or, or um, oxycontin being prescribed to them because of a surgery or, or an injury or something like that. Is there, is there any um, discussion or do you hear that people say, well, it's not just it's not just the drug abuse, but these people have committed crimes. Shouldn't they go to jail because they've committed crimes? I mean, how do you respond to that? Um, possessing these, these drugs mm -hmm. uh, is, is illegal, and a consequence needs to be had for that. A lot of people who, who begin uh, to commit crimes to support their addiction, it's, pro it's usually stealing. They're stealing from family members, neighbors, stores. Um, they need to be held accountable. Um, just because they have an addiction is not a, an excuse for that behavior. 
which is the beauty of these programs. These folks can be held accountable um, in, in the most productive way possible in, in, our, in our county, as far as I'm concerned. Um, they're given an opportunity to show up and engage in a treatment. They have to show up when they're told to show up. They have to drug screen when they're told to drug screen. And we require that they get clean through, through this process. Um, if they continue to, to use over time, if they refuse to show up, a consequence need to, needs to be had. Um, I, I don't believe that um, uh, addiction is an excuse for committing crimes. They need talk, to be held accountable. Talk a little bit about the court's involvement in this. I sort of have some, truth be told, I have some outside knowledge of the court's involvement, but talk a little bit about treatment court, how that works in conjunction with what um, with what you do. Yeah, we have uh, we have a drug treatment court in um, in Berkeley County for adults and for juveniles. And um, the adult drug court program is our is our highest level of community supervision, um, substance abuse treatment that a person can be involved in. Um, they're not only required to uh, engage in one of our intensive outpatient programs at the day report center, they're drug screened three times a week, but they also have a probation officer that is checking in with them daily. Um, they have to appear before the judge on a weekly basis while they're in phase one of the program. Um, there's a lot of eyes on them. There's a lot of support being given to them. And um, we've seen a lot of success from our drug court program. Um, folks that graduate from that program, we, we celebrate it. Uh, um, the judge has a, has a, Judge Lawrenson is our, as you know, um, our, uh, our treatment court judge. And he volunteers his time to do it. He's not required to do it. Um, but he cares about these folks, and he wants to see them do well. And um, I'm particularly proud to be a part of the drug court program. Tim, we've had a lot of money coming in uh, to the state for opioid settlement, and you're on one. Of, you're on the local distribution decision panel. How will that money be used? I, I wish I could answer that question. Are you referring to West Virginia First Foundation? Yes, I am. Yeah, um, that that's a, a process that I wish was unfolding a little a little faster. Um, it's been a learning experience for me being involved in the in the West Virginia First Foundation. Um, I mean, I had no no knowledge of, of what's involved in, in standing up a foundation like that. Um, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that needs to be um, uh, managed appropriately. Uh, and um, so so where things stand for the moment is um, the the executive director is uh, is networking with folks in the state, um, an expert panel. Is being put together a state expert panel, and I believe those folks who have been appointed to that panel are going to be named possibly next week uh, at the West Virginia First Foundation meeting. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and we want to get money out to the state as soon as possible, but a lot of work has to be done to make that happen. I detect a note of a, a frustration in your voice. Uh, is that a uh, uh, the fact that they need to do it right, other than doing it fast, or is it some bureaucratic red tape that's getting in the way? Um, I, I can't say that it's bureaucratic red tape. I think it's just something that I that I, that I wish could happen sooner, and I and I wish I had better answers for folks. Um, since the foundation, the, the the board exists of eleven people throughout the state. Um, it's and, and, and these aren't paid positions. This is in addition to everyone else's responsibilities. So um, uh, you could argue that, that we could be meeting more frequently. Um, I certainly would be willing to do that. But as it stands, we're meeting roughly on a monthly basis. Um, and we're leaning heavily on the executive director to build this foundation and to, and to get some staff in place and to begin to build infrastructure and grant programs um, and begin a process that uh, applicants can be screened appropriately, and w we kind of need to, to have a better idea of uh, where exactly in the state um, and, and what sorts of, of, of needs need to be funded. From local area, where, where do you see the greatest need for funding? Uh, I know that we have a big need for recovery housing. Um, uh, there's Oxford houses in Berkeley County, and that's about the extent of it. Um, and Oxford houses are not WVAR certified. Uh, which is West Virginia Association of Recovery something. Something. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so uh, Dr. Harton's actually with uh, Mountaineer Behavioral Health, um, Mountaineer Recovery Center, um, now Pyramid. Uh, he, he received some funding to begin the process of building 
some recovery houses in which paid staff would, would live in these houses. And I'm eagerly anticipating the completion of those projects, but my understanding is he, he ran out of money. There's some really nice structures that are over there just near Mountaineer Recovery Center, just off Route 9, that still need to be completed. And um, uh, funding is needed for those. Um, I know that's a, that's a big need in our area. People coming out of, of uh, Eastern Regional Jail or State Prison who are, who are on parole, they need safe places to live. And frequently enough, they go back to their, their old environments. And you, you mentioned a while ago the, uh, the drug problem in the uh, Eastern Panhandle at epidemic area, uh, levels. Uh, are we seeing an improvement in the uh, uh, improvement being fewer drugs coming in, or is it continue to escalate? Or can you tell? I believe there's improvement in regard to, uh, you know, especially in the last five years, the, the treatment options available to folks that need treatment. How about availability? I, as far as I can tell, drugs are still readily available. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know how, how, how we put a stop to that. Um, there have been two or three joint law enforcement efforts that have made raids that got quite a bit of publicity, but I haven't heard anything after that. I, th I think uh, law enforcement is doing everything that they can yeah. in this area to to uh, to deal with the drugs that are coming in. But as as soon as you take some down, more people fill in. And well, and that can be a function too, Tim. Don't you think of just the general growth? While you you know you pair you know you keep chipping away, chipping away, but then you have more people. So with more people come more yep. problematic situations. I yep. think. Magistrate Daryl Scholl with a comment uh, says, there's no greater reward as a magistrate than seeing a defendant sentenced to the Day Report Center come back a year later clean and sober. I've been told more than once by former users that the Day Report Center program saved their lives. Tim, is this a story you hear often? It is. Um, we've, uh, we have a, a lot of success stories that we could tell from folks who have come to the Day Report Center. And make no mistake, um, people who, who suffer from opiate use disorder and and hardcore alcoholism um, they don't like their condition they do not like living that way um, they don't wake up every morning and say it's a great day I'm gonna go get high no they're 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 enslaved to these problems and uh, they want to be free from them they just can't do it on their own uh, so programs like these exist and and give them give them that opportunity that they need to to get it right and uh, as they begin to 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 see a little bit more clearly and get some clean time under their belt they go wow thank you thank you um, and and it literally changes the trajectory of their lives is there a and we've only got about a minute left but is there a certain time marker where if you make it to this you've got a much better chance of saving your life if 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 our participants make it through the first 30 to 60 days they've got a great chance of of remaining um, most of our dropouts the, the large majority of them it's within 30 days they just don't show up um, they're they're not quite ready yet to commit to the program and and they fall out and most of them go back to jail yes Good. yeah and uh i can remember that interview like yesterday with doug copenhaver when he was proposing this I'm not sure who else was working with him on this Tim you may remember maybe Dan, Dan Delia too right okay very good and just the initial projections of I think the jail bill at that time was around $3 million, and Doug was thinking this might save uh, perhaps a, as much as a million dollars a year in the jail bill. One point of interest for, for your listeners, if, if I have a few seconds. About 30 of them. Since, since January 1st, from January 1st through June 30th, we completed about just a little more than 12,000 drug screens at the Day Report Center. A lot of people think that people go to the Day Report Center, they keep using drugs, and that's not the case. Um, out of those 12,000 drug screens, there were 273 of them that were positive for alcohol. There were 259 that were positive for cocaine, 257 positive for amphetamines, 174 positive for fentanyl, 139 positive for benzos, 122 positive for oxy. Now, THC, 1,400. Uh, that's still a problem, but um, these are numbers that I'm that I feel very good about. Sure. Out of 12,000 and something drug screens, only a few hundred are coming back positive yeah. for these substances. Most of our participants are doing doing well. Tim, thanks so much. Sure, thanks for having me. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.